Evening, everyone. I'll start again. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Women of Peace Corps Legacies International Day of the Girl Child event. My name is Katie McSheffrey, and I am currently the Vice President of Women of Peace Corps Legacy. I'm also a returned Peace Corps volunteer from Azerbaijan and a former Peace Corps staff member, where I had the honor to work with each of the organizations joining us this evening. We are so excited to share our program with you, and we have three amazing panelists joining us to share more about how their organizations are committed to addressing the gender digital divide facing girls today. In 2012, the United Nations declared October 11th as International Day of the Girl Child to raise awareness of gender inequality faced by girls worldwide based solely on their gender. Since the inception of International Day of the Girl, sorry, my dog. Since the inception of International Day of the Girl Child, Peace Corps volunteers, return Peace Corps volunteers, and the organizations represented here tonight have supported different programs that provide opportunities to address the gender, gender gap in areas such as education, nutrition, medical care, school-related gender-based violence, and forced child marriage. With the help of our panelists, we are thrilled to have the opportunity to highlight their work as part of our mission to broaden partnerships here and abroad. Only together can we address the challenges women and girls face, world, face worldwide. We know that technology has helped improve our lives in ways never seen before, which makes the theme for the 2021 International Day of the Girl Child, Digital Generation, Our Generation, so topical. The UN has launched this five-year initiative to address the ever-growing gender digital divide across the globe that impacts how girls are less able to connect, to own and use devices, to have the skills and our jobs to be a student or to have a career. While the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the necessity of using digital platforms for learning, earning, and connecting, girls are less likely to have access to these platforms. To explain more about the gender digital divide and to introduce our panelists, I would like to introduce Tristina. Hi, Katie. Thank you for um, for the introduction. Uh, so um, I'm so excited to be here tonight. There are some wonderful panelists here who have done some wonderful work in the world of gender equality. And the goal of this Women of Peace Corps Legacy event is to hear more about their work and to inspire action. So we hope to leave you with some um, some inspiration and then we will be sending you some information with regards to some resources and things and how you can get involved later on. Uh, so before I introduce our panelists, I just want to introduce myself again. Again, my name is Tristina. I'm a return Peace Corps volunteer um, from Peace Corps Comoros, and I really want to take this opportunity to kind of give a definition of what uh, digital inequality really is. Um, so in peace, when when serving in the Peace Corps, I really noticed the stark difference between in in um, inequality in digital access and also in inequality in um, digital literacy, and it, it really um, it was eye opening for me to to see that it was much harder for people to lift themselves out out of their circumstances um, and pursue other opportunities because a lot of resources are online. Uh, so when talking about gender digital the gender digital digital gap, um, UNICEF, uh, these facts come from UNICEF. So 2.2 billion people below the age of 25 still do not have internet access at home. And girls are less likely than boys to own their own devices and gain uh, tech related skills and jobs. Globally, the percentage of females among STEM graduates is below 15% in, only in over two thirds of countries. And when uh, you hear about digital access, it act when you hear about digital access, it is in reference to meaningful connectivity or being able to use internet every day with an appropriate device with enough data and a fast connection. Um, so, so clearly you can see that there's a lack of female representation in the digital realm. And there are a lot of opportunities and growth um, within this, this area. And we're gonna hear more about some of those tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists. You don't need to hear from me anymore. We wanna hear from the people that actually work in this area and, and have a lot of expertise. 
Um, so I also really want to encourage everybody to read their, the panelists' full bio. Um, it's on the P Women of Peace Corps Legacy event page website, as well as in the email that was sent out about the event. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce all of our panelists tonight. So our first first panelist I, um, is Adwa Edu. Um, she is the Senior Director of Global Girl Scouting and Girl Scouts of USA, where she is responsible for responsible for developing and implementing the organization's global strategy global strategy and we also have Casey Freed Jennings who's one of the founders of Girl Rising a non global nonprofit that is that uses powerful storytelling to change the way that girl value the 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 way the world values girls. She now leads Girls Rising US Educator Program, which brings the Girl Rising message of global connection, resilience, voice, and agency to young people across the country. And we also have with us Lynn O'Connell, that's 25 plus years of experience in the nonprofit sector as staff, consultant, and trainer, and a volunteer. Currently, Lynn is a member of several organizations, including Together Women Rise, where she is on the national she is a national board chair. So now we're going to this this section we're going to give each panelist you know a couple minutes to tell, tell us more about the their organization and um and then we'll move on to the Q&A portion of this event. So Lynn, would you like to start? Can you please tell us more about Together Women Rise and their work? Thank you, Christina. Uh, hello, as Christina told you, I'm Lynn O'Connell with Together Women Rise, and um, I don't have slides for you tonight because we recently changed our name, and I want to tell you that story and how we got to where we are today. So in 2004, in Greenville, South Carolina, a woman was celebrating her 50th birthday, and she divided, decided to invite some friends over, and they decided that they would pull their money and choose a charity to give the money to because the woman who had turned 50 thought she had everything and did not want large gifts to keep. Uh, the group ended up choosing an international organization that served women and girls. And the women discovered they also had a lot in common and they decided to keep meeting monthly. At that time, they began calling themselves Dining for Women. And Dining for Women became a 501c3 and then began to establish chapters across the country. Um, the original concept was that individuals would come to a monthly meeting and share dinner, and then they would give the money that they would normally spend on a dinner out to be given to the charity in need. Today, in 2021, we've given over $8 million in grants. We have nearly 500 chapters. This is post-COVID. Uh, and 2 million women, girls, family, and community members have been impacted by our grants. It's fascinating to see how we started with that one chapter, and today specifically, uh, we have 464 right now. We had 503 pre-COVID, but as with many of us, like everything else, that's been a bit of a setback there. Uh, we have 13 in the metro DC area, but they're everywhere from some of the smallest towns um, to some of the major metropolitan areas as well. Now, as we got into 2019 and 2020, we began to see that we needed to expand beyond just being about a chapter meeting where you share a meal and give money to help women and girls internationally. We decided that we wanted to be more for systemic change because we were at this point with a membership um, as we have now nearly 6,000 members. So carefully, carefully the organization and the board of directors worked over a period of nearly two years to draft a mission statement and vision statement, and then work on a new name that would represent who we are now. Uh, we changed our mission statement to now be, Together Women Rise cultivates the collective power of community to achieve global gender equality. And in a nutshell, we now focus on global gender equality, a much broader concept than when we began. We basically do our work in three core action areas, learning, giving, and community building. Learning is our first core area. And in that area, we do when our chapters, most of them still meet monthly uh, via Zoom, although some are back in per person now. And we have educational materials that are prepared 
on our grantees each month, including videos, uh, hard copy materials, graphics, et cetera, as well as discussion questions so that women in their communities around the country can talk about and discuss key issues involving global gender equality. It's a great way for folks on a local level, as well as on a lo local, a more national level connect. Then we also have our travel program. Our travel program is an opportunity for our members to join and travel to visit our grantees. Since we've been on hold this year a bit for 2022, we have uh, five sold out trips at the moment. Uh, one group is going to India to visit grantees, another is going to Jordan, another to Malawi, another Tanzania, and another to Nepal. Then we have our advocacy, and we actually have recently changed our advocacy to a national advocacy committee that works with the nonprofit results. And so we have about just over 200 women who get together and they've had the opportunity to be trained in how to reach out to Congress, uh, Congress representatives, both on a national level and locally to begin to advocate for change for advancing global gender equality and more funding internationally for women and girls in need. So that's been a great opportunity for individuals who really were interested in becoming very knowledgeable and skilled at that. Then we have a national virtual meeting each month. And in that, uh, it's for people who may not be at a chapter, who may have missed their chapter meeting or simply want more. In that case, we always have representatives from each of our grantees actually on the virtual national meeting and individuals and members can interact with the grantees as well as with each other. And then finally, under learning, we have our book group. Our book group meets every other month. Uh, for January, we're doing the book by the Nigerian uh, uh, woman, The Girl with a Louding Voice. Uh, we did cast in September. We also tend to get a fair number of authors who participate there. Julia Alvarez joined us this summer for uh, In the Time of the Butterflies, and Margaret Atwood was at our most recent book club as well. So moving from learning then to giving, which is central to what we are, we are about as a grant making organization, we give out uh, currently two grants each month. One is to a featured grantee and that is up to $50,000 each month. That featured grantee uh, would be uh, a first time grantee that, that has applied for project funding and our grant selection committee has chosen them and they are represented that month. Our sustained grantees are nonprofits that we have funded in the past that did great work and we fund them for three years at 25,000 annually for each of the three years. And it gives us our organization, us as members, as well as our members in general, an opportunity to learn and see how they're making change and to really feel like they're partnering with the nonprofit. Our last- Lynn. Oh, Lynn, I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, uh, do you, I, go ahead, go ahead and finish. We're just got a couple more seconds. Okay, seconds. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Um, last area would be community building, and that is our chapter model, which is so keen, key to us because we feel like if women connect in their community, um, it gives them not only the, the joy of supporting women and girls globally, but they also get that strong connection, particularly during COVID. And in conclusion, as we've seen over the past couple of years, we at Together Women Rise remember that our work only grows more important, sadly, or, or not each year. And we're very thankful to be there. Thank you, Tristina. And sorry I went over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're fine. Uh, thank you, Lynn, for for speaking with us. I'm really loving that you have this collective power of community and and what that represents. Um, so thank you for coming tonight, and um, we'll we'll come back to you with questions later. Okay, so next we have Casey Free Jennings, and she will talk about Girl Rising. Oh, hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, I said I was. I was just saying to myself that um, I have very few regrets in life, except one of them has always been that I didn't join the communities of you all who did. Um, you are much wiser than I. Um, I'm going to share my screen here for a little. I have a couple of slides, and um, 
So um, here we go. Okay. Oops. Are you seeing me now? Yes, Is we you see you. Mm -hmm. We Oops, see you. Like Thank you. They look great. Except now you're seeing this. Hold on one second. I'm sorry about that. There we go. Okay. So um, as you heard before, Bull Rising is a nonprofit organization, and we use stories, as you see, to change the way the world values girls and their education, and probably at least as important the way girls value themselves. Um, and we do this simply because we know that educated girls will change the world. Educated and independent girls will change the world. We know it's a great investment. We know that it's one of the most powerful solutions to pretty much all of the world's most difficult problems. And we know that even pre-pandemic, there were 130 million girls out of school around the world. And we also know that's a waste of talent, it's a waste of creativity, it's a waste of smarts, it's indefensible to say nothing of immoral. So storytelling is the centerpiece of all the work we do. It's what we create, it's how we collaborate with our partners, educators, and organizations around the world. And it's our most critical tool for activation. In other words, it's um, stories are how we inspire people and particularly young people, because they're the sort of crux of everything we do as well, to use their voices to take action and to be part of change. We started with a film um, several years ago, and, and this remains the, oops, sorry. I shouldn't have done that, where are we? Sorry about that, we started with a film. Um, and that remains the most powerful spine of our work. It tells the stories of nine girls, for those of you who haven't seen it around the world, who face barriers to their independence with boldness and determination and courage. And um, among them are girls like Senna from Peru and Suma from Nepal. And, oops, sorry, this isn't. I'm having a bad day, and widely um, from Haiti. And you'll see that these stories, all of these stories, are like those stories of Suma and Senna and Wadley, are stories of resilience and possibility of hope. They deal with what's wrong with the world, and they deal with the challenges. In the end, that's what they're really about. They're stories about what can be and very much what should be. And so to give you a taste of that, we're going to show you um, our trailer for the film. It's short and I hope powerful. And tell me if you don't hear it when it starts. Tonight, one of the bravest girls in the world. Malala Yousafzai became renowned for demanding girls be given the right to education shot in the head on her school bus. She was a student who wanted to learn, but now she's fighting to live. I was 11 years old when my father arranged for me to be married. Staring at the I had heard about the thousands of girls sold to men in those places. I can't really talk about everything that happened to me here, but I will never forget. We have come to this house, the house of her master, to say, you must set her free. Nothing. 
anything to stop. I feel I can do anything. Um, so that's a taste of Girl Rising, glimpses of the stories we tell and I think why we tell them. And with them and around them, we built on very robust curriculum materials and other educational resources, including books, radio programs, digital lessons, et cetera. Um, the film and the stories and those educational resources are the core of the work we do of our global programs now in 12 countries uh, that are focused largely on reaching educators and the young people that they reach, but also families and community leaders, the gatekeepers and business community and government leaders and policymakers as well. Um, and the work comes in many forms and is distributed in many ways um, to reach many audiences, some of which we'll probably talk about a little later, but always with a very, very clear intention. And that is to help change the harmful gender norms and attitudes that prevent girls and women from being educated, from being independent and being important contributors to making our world a much better place. Um, so I'll stop here and pass it on. Thank you, Casey. Um, I really, um, that trailer always gets me. I've watched it a few times and um, I have purchased the movie and I'm going to watch it with my niece, um, my nieces, and um, have a conversation hopefully um, around that. So thank you for sharing. Uh, now we're going to move on to Ajwa. Ajwa, can you tell us more about Girl Scouts? Thanks so much, Christine. Hello, everyone. I'm um, Ajoy Edu, Senior Director of Global Girl Scouting, and so glad to be uh, joining, having you guys join us this evening. And I think Anne was going to be helping me with my slides. And if not, then I can. Oh, there we go. Thanks so much. You can go to the next slide. So, um, just a quick overview of Girl Scouts of the USA. We are a movement of 2.1 million members with 170 million girls and 750,000 volunteers um, throughout the country at our 112 councils and in 91 countries around the world through our USA Girl Scouts Overseas program. USA Girl Scouts Overseas serves uh, daughters of military, foreign service, and expats who are living abroad in addition to girls in American and international schools. Um, and we're also fortunate enough to be members of the World Association of Girl Guys and Girl Scouts. And this puts us in a sisterhood of uh, 152 countries around the world, all working towards girls' uh, leadership and development. And our mission is to build girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. We do this through our Girl Scout leadership experience, which is our organization's approach to leadership development that helps girls cultivate important skills so they can take the lead in their own world and lives. Go to the next slide. The GSLE model is supported by research that shows that when girls experience a variety of activities, um, for us specifically looking at anywhere from three to five or more foundational activities that are facilitated by supportive adults, using our three processes, which are girl-led, cooperative learning, and learning by doing, that girls can achieve our five leadership outcomes. Um, looking at having a strong sense of self, where girls have confidence in themselves and their abilities to perform positive identities, positive values, where girls act ethically, honestly, and responsibly, and show concern for others. Challenge seeking, where girls can take appropriate risks, try things even if they might fail and learn from those mistakes healthy relationships, um, the girls develop and maintain healthy relationships by communicating their feelings directly and resolving conflicts constructively and community problem solving, where girls desire to contribute to the world in purposeful and meaningful ways, learn how to identify problems in the community and create action plans to solve them. Our programs are age appropriate and directed towards girls K through 12, covering a broad range of topics and are accessible to girls through a variety of experiences, from online content to challenges to global programming, um, and really focusing on making sure that girls have the know-how to invent the future, um, set girls up with skills they need to lead um, in their lives, inspire girls to love nature and seek adventure, and prepare girls with business smarts so they can take on the world. I wanted to 
um, really focus on our STEM programming that are great, um, my great colleagues who work on this have spent the last few years really expanding on since IDG is focused on the digital divide. Um, our goal, goal for our STEM programming is to offer all Girl Scouts high quality progressive programming that increases their STEM interest, confidence and competencies. We really, we, tend in, we intend for this to translate into more women in STEM, STEM, excuse me, helping to close the digital divide and reduce economic disparities. So we really do this by improving the world. I'm sorry, you can go back. Uh, we do this by, we found that, um, we found that improving the world is why girls are most interested in STEM, and we focus on our using utilizing our three processes, which I, uh, I mentioned before, which really align with how best to engage girls in these in this topic, and that offering that safe, supportive place where the girls can do that challenge seeking. We start early and support girls, um, and lastly, with more than our 50, than 50 million Girl Scout alumni, we're able to amplify what we do with experts, mentors, and role models for girls. About five years ago, so just kind of talking a little bit more about how, uh, what our programming entails. Um, about five years ago, our Girl Scouts, made, Girl Scouts made STEM a priority area. Our team conducted research with girls and our local councils to found out what they needed and wanted from a national STEM programming. And we also met with experts and tested our program format. Since that time, we've developed program centered on three focus areas that include engineering, outdoor STEM and computer science. The program is progressive both within and through our six um, Girl Scout grade levels, allowing girls with varying knowledge of STEM to take part at any age. And moving into the future, we plan to amplify this foundational STEM program with more resources for volunteers and our councils, as well as unique experiences for girls. Um, the programs wouldn't be possible without partners. So we are fortunate enough to have STEM partners with both funding partners as well as content experts who work with us to make sure that we are really developing a quality program. To measure the impact of our program, our research team has developed a set of STEM measures to assess both local and national programs. First, looking at um, a girl who is interested in STEM and identify a subject as something she likes and wants to learn more about and pursue further. Next, um, a girl who is confident in STEM that she has the skills and abilities to successfully engage in STEM programs and activities. Um, we also found that a girl who is competent in STEM has learned the intended skills and content of that program. And finally, a girl who understands the value of STEM to people in society and believes that STEM knowledge and pursuits are important and relevant to real life. And these can be used to address both personal and societal issues. Over the past four years, um, over 1.4 million STEM badges and awards have been earned by Girl Scouts. And most importantly, we have found that our program has been successful. In 2019, our research team found that Girl Scouts were more likely than non-Girl Scouts to be interested in STEM and careers and technology. And they also found that Girl Scouts maintained their interest through adolescence at the same time as many other girls are dropping out of STEM subjects. Our programs have are given girls the training, mentoring, and hands-on experience to help them understand the value of STEM to society and the options for their own career path. We aim to educate girls from a young age about why STEM matters and inspire them to be leaders of tomorrow, and we want them to have the skills they need to solve problems and make a difference. Thank you. Wow, Ajwa, thank you for sharing. That's really um, exciting to hear that Girl, Scout, um, Girl Scouts is doing some um, work in STEM as well. I, I was a Girl Scout. I'm a product of, of that. And um, I, I think I, I can feel like I've learned a lot and it really helped me be, kind of go out of my comfort zone. Um, that's probably why I'm speaking to you all tonight. <laughs> um, Thank you all for the pre presenters. We're going to go ahead and move on to the the Q and A portion of the of the event. Um, so, if you want to ask a question, please just go ahead and put that in the chat box, and Stephanie will be monitoring that, and we'll check in with her um, to get any questions that you may have. Uh, in the meantime, I do have some questions for the panelists, and I can just go ahead and get us started um, while you all, um, you know, get your brain brains flowing and trying to get, try to figure out what you want to ask. Um, so my first question I have is for Casey, 
Um, Casey, can you please provide examples of how Girl Rising has used and is using online platforms to connect girls globally? And tell us why Girl Rising decided to use this technology to connect girls globally. Well, Girl Rising is, among other things, very much about connection and community. So connecting and community are very, very important to us. Um, and it's about crossing borders of all kinds. It's about crossing cultural borders and geographic borders. And obviously the best way to do that is with the technology we have now at our disposal or, the, or certainly sometimes the only way and easiest way. So that sort of online communication has been very important to us from the beginning, very early on. We were um, fortunate enough to be invited to join Skype in the classroom, which is no longer, but it was a wonderful platform um, whereby we were um, asked to come and visit classrooms all around the world with Girl Rising and have conversations with students all over the world. So we did that. Um, and then there's a wonderful platform that y'all may know of called IRON. And I never can remember what it stands for. And it's really a terrible name, but a wonderful organization, which is an online collaborative platform where um, educators actually create their own projects. So we had nothing to do with putting Girl Rising up there. A couple of educators did, one Japanese and one from California. And what is it? An opportunity for classrooms around the world to collaborate with each other around these projects. So there've been about classrooms from about 45 countries, I think, that have been part of the Girl Rising project over the years. And six or seven at a time will be communicating with each other. Um, and it happens through, you know, sort of very, excuse me, chat rooms and, um, sorry, that's my dog forums. Um, and also they, oops, um, they also will, uh, I knew this was gonna happen at some point, um, but they also will get, you know, have virtual conversations with each other and things like that. Um, and then we are also live now on a whole variety of ed tech platforms with our curricular materials. We're on Flipgrid, we're on a brand new one called Explore, Share My Lessons. And these are all ways of putting our resources out there, all of which are free, by the way, um, and make them easily avail available to as many people as possible. Um, and then I don't want to take up too much time, but, but because of COVID, you know, we obviously launched a bunch of other new initiatives, including an online module that results in a, a project for using social media for social good. And again, the idea of creating a global community, all doing that together, creating memes to empower girls. Um, we have online learning guides. We have um, e-facilitation guides for teachers. We have all of that kind of thing. So we've tried to use um, technology as robustly as possible. But as we both know, the digital divide is a reflection of the economic divide. And so it's fine to do all of that, but we're very cognizant of the fact that there are many, many people in the world who don't have access um, to the technology and therefore we think very hard about how to um, create hard copies of things and create uh, offline learning experiences and possibilities, even if that means using digital technology to get the materials to teachers who can then print them out and things like that. I could go on and on, but I'm not going to because there are a lot of other people with a lot to say. Thank you, Casey. Um, Ajo, you're on mic. Did you have something you wanted to add to that? No, I did not, sorry. Oh, it's okay. I just want to make sure I didn't, I didn't exclude you. Uh, thank you, Casey. That's um, was really interesting to hear about that and all of those free programs. That's I'm, I wrote all of those down. That's great to know that those are out there. Um, okay, so the next question is for Lynn. Um, Lynn, without equal access to technology and the internet, girls are being held back in technology and STEM fields. In your experience working with girls, what is preventing girls from utilizing technology and or creating technology? So many things, so many things. And uh, Casey acknowledged some of them already, but the whole global gender equality issue has set up structural barriers, economic, as she mentioned, as well as other logistical barriers. Um, school and education are not equally available. Therefore, the girls may not get to school. As Casey mentioned, COVID also has, has interfered by creating further blocks. And even if girls are given laptops or other things. In some of the communities that we have done work in, you have issues with getting electricity. You have issues with the, the girls then becoming the victims of theft. So it's really a broader issue. Quickly, just two examples of things Together Women Rise has done recently, um, recently 
to to address it. We gave a grant to Edu Girls in India. Uh, initially, the girls there only had access to the desktops in the school for two hours a week, all of the girls, the just two hours. And so we did give them individualized laptops where they could begin learning IT skills, and it also uh, helped their families who didn't have computers at home. In another instance, we funded the Dream Project in the Dominican Republic. This was before COVID, they were doing work with the uh, girls between the ages of 12 and 18 on empowerment, leadership, uh, becoming communicators. And at COVID, the schools cl closed down. So this funding was develop an app, which they gave on laptops to the girls as well so they could continue with the curriculum even during COVID. Those are just a couple of examples. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, I, I definitely saw um, the access to computers and electricity in where I was served in the Peace Corps. So can very much relate to, um, uh, to, to what you said there. And it was, um, it made things very difficult, so. Thank you, thank you, Lynn. And uh, the next question is for Ajwa. Um, one second here. Okay, Ajwa, um, technology can be a powerful tool for girls to become activists on issues directly in, that directly impact their lives. We know how some girls have reached large audiences through social media platforms. Do you have any examples of how girls have designed apps and or programs that are relevant and useful in some way to girls? Yes, we have um, lots of girls who do this actually. So one of the things that happen in Girl Scouts is called um, our highest awards. Um, Girl Scouts, one of the big pieces of our programming is really centered around girls learning how to take sustainable action. Um, and that means that they are addressing a root cause in a community or finding something they're passionate about, addressing a root cause around that, um, working in community with around that solution and really identifying a sustainable solution. Um, and there's three ways, there's a progression as we have in everything we do in Girl Scouting, um, bronze, silver and gold award is the highest, but um, some, and we, for our International Day of the Girl, celebrated the 3,500 girls who earned their gold award over the past year. And some of the ones who were doing some really amazing projects around digital um, that are connected to digital or STEM, um, there was a young woman who is from New Jersey who actually did an amazing project where she went and create and trained um, school teachers in her um, family's um, home village or hometown in India on, on, on STEM and digital literacy. So she trains their teachers and then created a mobile, almost like library or teaching tool that goes around 25 cities in rural um, Andhra Pradesh um, teaching girls, um, young people. There was um, another young woman who actually worked with her local food bank to, uh, and actually a local Meals on Wheels, um, I believe, organization to digitize their um, delivery method to help them save money and be environmentally conscious. Um, and then we have, I, I know there was one girl who actually also created an entire online um, tutoring uh, tutoring program to support low income communities during this time of COVID. And there's many, many more. So we're very fortunate that we have these uh, amazing girls really stepping into to this space. Wow, that's really, it's really great. I was, that's, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna pause it here for any questions from the audience. Steph, do you have a new, what do you got for us? Um, well, uh, there was a question posed of how to get involved, but I think we're going to address that at the end of um, the uh, at, at the end of the hour. Um, but Lee Lacey also wanted to know from Ajua what the international branch of the Girl Scouts are, is currently doing now. I, Lee, if you want to expand on, do you mean you know given the pandemic and um, all the issues we're having worldwide, or was there something more specific you wanted to know about the international branch? It was, I, I, Adwa and I had conversation, I think about two years ago, and it was my understanding that uh, the Girl Scouts were really developing more of an international program that might mm, use the, the experiences that Return Peace Corps volunteers bring to um, this work. 
Yeah, so that essentially is um, the work of our global department. And um, I remember, yeah, we had a couple of conversations about our work around cross-cultural competencies um, that we were working on at the time. Um, so that is still kind of, is, is actually in development right now and we're hoping to have it released in the next couple of years, but we're exploring how best um, that's going to be um, implemented. But we do um, do a lot of work around global issues and global advocacy. So we have a lot of content around the sustainable development goals that we release every single year. Um, we um, are fortunate enough to have membership at the UN. So we do engagement with girls at the UN, um, participating in like the Commission on the Status of Women with girls each year. Um, and, you know, really having one of the things that came out of the pandemic and things like CSW going virtual is um, an opportunity to figure out how to use those virtual platforms to take opportunities like CSW and, and have them go um, to reach more of our members. So that's something that we're, we're working on. So um, I guess to say that in terms of work, uh, the work continues and some things are, are, are um, oncoming, but um, we're excited about where it's going to go. Hope I answered your question. Okay, and then Tristina, I think you had a couple more questions you might want to have asked. Sure, yeah, I'll go ahead. And, uh, the next question is for Adwa again. <laughs> um, Adwa, one barrier for women in digital gender gap is a concern for privacy, a misuse of data on, and online harassment and abuse. What do you see as key factors to help overcome these barriers? Um, I guess so as it specifically relates you know, to, to girls um, and young women is really about education, awareness, and training. Um, and that is one of the things that we've worked on. Um, this past year, we released a new set of um, cyber digital literacy badges in addition to cybersecurity badges. Um, so teaching girls about um, you know, how um, they might get hacked, um, but also awareness about um, what happens online? How do you engage? How do you um, monitor your your mental health and wellness? About you know when to be able to step away. Um, so that education, awareness, and training for girls, I think, is really important to help um, so they can understand when uh, those spaces are you know become threatening or dangerous for them. Thank you for for answering that and when listening to your answer I just was kind of reflecting on my own childhood and being a Girl Scout and I was like that's a very different world I didn't have to really worry about that when I was younger um, but I'm glad to see that Girl Scouts are addressing it thank you for answering so the next question is for Casey um, given that we are facing climate change globally can you talk more about the Girl Rising Future Rising initiative and the importance of girls having uh, and the importance of girls that have they have an, an emerging, an emerging, sorry, an emerging green economy. My gosh, uh, did um, did you did you understand that yes, question? Absolutely, I okay. did, and I am absolutely thrilled to be able to discuss it. So, Future Rising is our largest new initiative at Girl Rising, um, and it's going to be a big one. And our, the object is to use the Girl Rising stories along with newly created stories of all kinds, including digital, of course, to open eyes and minds to the critical, most critical connection between girls, education, and climate change. On the one hand, we know that in many parts of the world, uh, girls and women are disproportionately impacted by climate change. And on the other hand, we know that educated girls and women are a most critical part of the solution to climate change. Um, and the way we think of it is, is just as the world becomes more prosperous, safer, more peaceful when girls are educated, so does the world become greener when girls are educated. Um, so we're really, really excited about this because we know we can't leave half of our population um, out of solving, away from solving those problems. And, you know, our survival depends on it. And that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of power out there we can harness and we want very much to do that. Um, it's not only, you know, as they say about girls' education, it's not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Same thing when it comes to um, climate change and bringing girls into the conversation and into the solution and using all that power to do it. So we're going to um, 
create new resources, new stories. We're supporting those who um, want to tell their stories and talk about this connection and explore this connection, research this collection. Um, we currently have an, a Future Rising Fellows initiative of a bunch of young people who are doing incredible work in the climate change space, and we're supporting their work and the, the, story, and the way they want to tell their stories using graphic novels, uh, photography, film, journalism, all of that. Um, and um, we just just finished writing a new lesson plan that'll be part of the climate action campaign uh, project, which is about girls and climate change. So those are some of the things we're doing and we're incredibly excited about it and think it's you know the logical next step um, as a as a companion to the other work we're doing. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I selfishly asked that, uh, designed that question because I wanted to know more because I was uh, on the website and I watched the video and it was, it was pretty intriguing. And um, for everybody, uh, go ahead and go onto the Girl Rising website. There's some more content on there. Um, so thank you, Casey. Okay, Lynn, um, I have a question for you regarding um, uh, the working within with Computer Core. So, as an executive director at Computer Core and seeing gender equality through the through a domestic lens, what are some takeaways from this experience, and how have you been able to apply it to gender equality with an international lens, like um, with your work with for uh, with Together Women Rise? And just so you all know, Computer Core is an organization in Virginia whose mission is um, has been to prepare underserved adults and to realize career aspirations and foundational digital and professional skills. So, um. yes, and it's it's interesting. Um, when I first went th to work there in 2008 as executive director, following the founder, I'm not sure what I originally thought at the time. Uh, maybe I actually knew this all that long, but what I quickly learned is no, 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 no. It's not just teach someone to use a computer in America and then they can get a great job. No, it's got to be comprehensive in so many ways. Um, at Computer Core, I would laugh uh, because one of my key tasks always seemed to be I was seeking out pro bono or very inexpensive dentist. I couldn't imagine how many people had dental issues that needed to be resolved before they could actually concentrate on learning and applying and getting a job and showing up for work. And that translates so perfectly over to work anywhere internationally, at least what I've seen in, with Together Women Rise. For example, uh, I mentioned in the previous question that one of the projects we had funded was Edu Girls in India, where we gave them laptops and IT skills. Well, we did that part, but the nonprofit itself, when they were setting all this up, they needed to be sure that the school had a secure campus so the girls would be safe. They had to secure safe transportation to get the girls to and from school. Then they had to provide health care. The girls needed winter clothing. They needed more training on how to uh, perform in vocational tasks and they needed scholarships to go on to for, for their education. It wasn't simply laptops and IT skills. It was so much more. And even as we look around at other things, I'll just mention very briefly one other grant that we gave that is humorous but involves IT and tech. Now it is more directed at, at, at uh, women who are having babies. So it's not necessarily directly at girls, but we funded a program in Uganda called the Mama Rescue Project. And this was basically given giving women in very remote areas transportation for women who were in labor to access either a clinic or an emergency hospital if they needed to. So uh, the project we funded actually provided GPS service for the female motorcycle drivers. Now, I can't imagine riding on a motorcycle on a dirt road when I'm pregnant, but okay. And then also it funded emergency response mobile devices for the midwives in the remote villages. And so there's always so much more than simply the tech skills or giving them the computer. It's mu very much a, a whole community of, of needs. It's a lot of things we don't necessarily think about or take for granted for sure. So thank you, Lynn, uh, for answering that question. Um, is there any other questions in the chat box that we can address? Um, 
Lynn, do you know how many, um, you happen to know offhand, how many return Peace Corps volunteers are involved with uh, Together Women Rise? I wish I knew an exact number. I've asked that forever because I am very intrigued and excited by returned Peace Corps volunteers. I do know a number of them who are involved, but but I wish I had a count and I wish there was a way to do it. Um, but I do know, I mean, Lee Lacey leads a chapter and some of you, does anyone know Sue Malik? I think she knows everyone, but I don't know. <laughs> okay, I see. Okay. Yes. So, and of course, Carrie Hessler Radelais on our board. But I wish I did. And if there's a way to find that number, I would love it. Thank you. Um, that's not what we had so far, Tristina. If you okay, I think we had a couple more questions in our list, though. If you wanna... Yeah, I can. I have. I have, I have so many questions. <laughs> um, this is for whoever wants to ask answer. Uh, so um, we have recently witnessed the testimony of the ex Facebook employee uh, to Congress, France, Frances Hewn, um, on Instagram, on how Instagram has harmed children, especially teenage girls. Hewn referred to a Facebook study that found that 13.5% of UK teen girls um, have, of girls have suicidal thoughts, and it's increased after starting Instagram. Um, another study revealed that 17% of teen girls say that their eating disorders have worsened and that 32% of teen girls felt bad about their bodies. What has your organizations done to curb this negative impact in digital use? And please give examples. Is there any one of you want to take that one? That's a, that's a, that's a, a hard one. I mean, uh, I, I'll start briefly. I feel like um, I, I mentioned it. We had our literacy badges and our cybersecurity badges. Uh -huh. um, and we're also going to be starting some work um, as we've seen the big impact that was happening, I think, before the pandemic, but even more so now around um, mental wellness. Um, and I'm sure, you know, that engagement on social media, et cetera, will, uh, will kind of will rise up in some of that work as well. Sure. I'll just add, you know, at Core Rising, we don't specifically deal with that and we don't specifically deal with um, Instagram, but what we have, uh, you know, but a major, major part of the work we do, especially here in the U.S., is about um, developing voice and agency and confidence. And so indirectly, I hope very much that that would come into play with that. And one of the, um, and I mentioned earlier, the online module we created during COVID that culminates in the meme project with the idea of using social media for social good. In other, in other words, to turn people away from so, using social media in that really negative way and understanding how you can use it to really make a difference and make good things happen. Um, so it's um, so indirectly, we hope, I mean, directly, we hope the work we're doing um, pays off in that way, but we only approach it indirectly. Thank you although, although I'll add teachers use Girl Rising in all sorts of different ways. So many, so I know of one tech teacher who uses it directly to deal with those things, but that's not something we necessarily do. It's how these creative individuals decide to use the work. That we sure. All right. Well, thank you very much for answering that question. We have about four minutes left. Is there any uh, questions we didn't get to in the, in the chat box, Stephanie? Um, Someone did ask about, um, even though it wasn't a digital divide issue, um, they were curious from Lynn if she's still on. I know she has to leave in a couple of minutes. Um, how um, we might have missed, you might have mentioned it, but uh, how Dining for Women gets their funding for the projects that get support. Uh, we get our funding from our members. And it's interesting. It's, thank you for asking that question because we use the word member. And a member is anyone who gives a quarter or more a year. So we're a very low barrier to entry and people can come to things and give nothing, which is very interesting. But that being said, uh, we have individual members who give major gifts every year, ranging from 5,000 to 80,000. So um, it is interesting. I think Dining for Women Together, Women Rise is a great example of what one woman, 10 women, 500 women can do over time. And then suddenly you look and you're giving away a $50,000 and a $25,000 grant each month. It's pretty amazing. That's amazing. Thank Thanks. you. And the last question might be before you um, 
maybe ask your last question, Christina, is um, Ashley Bloxon wanted to know if there were any exciting new ventures um, on the horizon that you'd like to share with the audience, uh, like what the future holds for all the panelists. If you wanna just take 30 seconds and give one thing that's coming up that's- I think exciting. I sort of answered with future what rising for girl rising, um, but that in the general, expansion of our work um, in various countries around the world and the morphing of it into the creative use of storytelling in various ways. In Guatemala, we're using radio because that's more effective there. And, um, you know, we're trying to be as responsive as possible in the community's work to where we work to their needs and um, the way they feel they can be most effective um, in partnering with us. But future risings are really big, you no know, exciting thing, I would say. For Together Women Rise, we are working on a reimagining grants program for 2022 because we funded so many over the years of our existence, so many grantees. What we're trying to do now is bring them together to partner and work on collaborations uh, with us for greater systemic change. Now, we're still developing how that's going to look, though. Um, I think for Girl Scouts, I mentioned we are, you know, hoping in the next year to launch um, really strong programming around mental wellness for for girls. We're getting ready. We meet every every three years, and so in 2023, we'll be having a large gathering of girls um, in Orlando to come together and really talk about the issues that they're passionate about. Um, and so we're. I'm uh, really excited about that and having girls kind of lead us in the conversation on how best to support them today. Thank you all for, for being here. I have one last question uh, before we go. I know, Lynn, you have to, to jump off, so I'll let you take it first. But uh, how can we get involved in, um, with your organization? Good. I was just typing that in the chat box to send everyone. <laughs> so basically, as I mentioned, we're a low barrier in the sense that you can come to one meeting or you can suddenly become a, a chapter leader like Lee Lacey or um, just come to our book club or just come to one natural national virtual meeting if you're interested in Guatemala. We have many ways and because we're so um, large and community based that um, there's really no obligation, but we can help connect you. If you're interested in advocacy, we can help you there. So what I'm doing is basically saying in the chat box to send me an email and I'll get you connected to the right place. But we would love to have, you know, as, as the question came, how many uh, returned Peace Corps volunteers do you have? My answer really should be, and it usually is, not nearly enough. So <laughs> thanks to each of you. And, um... Ajwa, you want to talk about how you can get it, uh, how we sure. can get involved with you? Uh, we also will be sending out those resources you sent us too. So, Great, thanks. I mean, so for Girl Scouts, we all are always looking for volunteers, and there's lots of different ways to volunteer. You can volunteer, of course, and support girls in a troop. You may be able to help your local council in different um, for. Uh, different events and programs that they may be having. Um, you can also volunteer to support us at our national level. We have a national volunteer program um, as well, where we engage volunteers um, at our national level in different events and programming. So um, I'm going to, I'll put it in the chat, and I know it's in the resources as well to learn how to volunteer um, with Girl Scouts. And I will also say, from a local level, we are also always looking for Return Peace Corps volunteers to come and tell girls about their experience and make that global connection. So thank you all for having me. Thank you. I will be there. I love, I love, I love talking about my Peace Corps experience. <laughs> Maybe a little too much sometimes. Um, Casey, can you tell us how we can get involved with the Girls Rising? Yeah, sadly, we do not have a volunteer program. We're not big enough for that. Um, and we're not small enough for that. We're somewhere in between. But um, you know, our aim is really simple. It's to reach as many pe people as we possibly can with our message um, and with our resources that we think are very effective. So there are a million ways you can use it. You saw the trailer for the film. Actually, those stories are each can each be individually used. They're on YouTube. They're free. All our resources are free, except for the book, because the publisher won't let us make that free. Um, they can be used in a million different ways. They're, they are used in a million different ways in schools and after school um, organizations, activities, uh, in after school clubs. They're used to raise money. They're used to raise awareness. Um, they're used, kids use them to create symposiums of their own and um, 
events at their schools. We've seen fabulous public art, or, uh, public art projects that emerge from the statistics and the stories in the film. We see poetry, a school in Colorado did a, play, a musical, a full-blown musical, Girl Rising the Musical. Um, so my point just being, it's, it's you're only limited by your imagination, but the way to, you know, it's really the way to get involved is to use our resources to reach people, especially young people, because they're the ones who are the future. And they're the ones who we want to know um, first, we want them to know about the rest of the world, and we want them to know that they too have voice and they too have agency and they too can be part of change, good change. Um, and as John Lewis said, make good trouble. And that's what we'd like to see them do. Um, so yeah, and um, please reach out to me if you want to speak more specifically, because I know that was super general, but um, there, you know, I can get much more um, granular in a conversation. So please feel free to reach out. Thank you, Casey. Um, it's very exciting um, to hear everybody, what everybody's doing um, in this world. It's something that touches my heart deeply. They really, something I saw a real need for um, personally when I was in the Peace Corps. And so thank you all for being here tonight. I want to um, specifically thank, you know, Lynn, Casey, and Ajwa for your time and, and for inspiring us. Also wanted to do a special thank you to Megan Donahue for giving me your time and helping me with um, uh, coordinating all of this and, and mentoring me through this process. And uh, thank Anne, Annie Tansley and Sarah Durson for your time in the Zoom room and online and making sure everybody, the word got out about it. I couldn't really do any of I couldn't have coordinated any of this without all of this 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 group of, of fabulous women. Thank you to Katie for your introduction at the beginning, and thank you for, to Lee and Elizabeth and the rest of the program committee for, you know, guiding me through um, designing this this program and um, and whatnot. And thanks to Stephanie for the chat box. I'm I swear I'm almost done with my thank yous. I'm a big thank you person. I just will thank people all the time. But I also want a quick thank you to Stacy Ferguson who helped us also um, coordinate. Um, um, some of our panelists, and I really appreciate you all coming tonight. So thank you so much, and hopefully we will see you again. <laughs>